Uh, hey, this morning I want to talk about my message. Is we went to a wedding. Uh, I will get to my message title. We went. I got to get Bundaberg out of me because uh, we went to a wedding and uh, uh, just when was it last week sometime and uh, and Pastor Rick said something in the wedding that uh, just hit me and I wrote it down uh, there in the wedding and uh, and knew that I was going to preach on that that statement that Pastor Ricky. Um, uh, said at the wedding, and the, 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 the quote is, fall in love with God's version of the future. Do you remember saying that? No. <laughs> I assure you, you did. And uh, fall in love with God's version of the future. And he was talking to a young couple who were just, uh, you know, desperately in love with one another, ready for, you know, anything the future uh, has in store for them. Uh, and it was beautiful. And uh, it just went into my spirit, fall in love with God's version of the future. One, one scripture that sort of matches that, it's a favorite scripture of mine, I'm sure it's a, a favorite of yours, is Jeremiah 29 11. It says, For I know is God talking, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Uh, and the thing I want you to know is that God's got a plan for you. In fact, God's got a plan for every single person in this room. And we would, as Christians, be well advised to spend the rest of our life hearing from heaven about the length, the breadth, the depth, the details of that God-given destiny uh, for each one of us, uh, for our lives. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, you know, around this Easter week, it's um, a kind of a relevant issue. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed the prayer that every single one of us should be praying every day of our lives. And the prayer goes like this. It's uh, Jesus as he's facing, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, facing uh, the crucifixion and he knows what's coming. In Luke 22 verse 40, he asks the Father, if, the, if, there's, if you are willing, take this cup from me. In other words, he's, he's saying, is there another way? He recognized what he's, he's about to face and he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. And that's the prayer that every one of us should be praying every single day of our lives. Not my will, but yours be done. Fall in love with God's version of your future, not yours. And do it every day. Before the, the foundation of the earth, I'm here to inform you, you already know that God had a plan for you. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works in me and this my soul knows very well the works of God in me. I am completely up to speed with all that you want to do through me. That's your prayer. Can you pray that this morning? Well, there's, there's variations of that. There's a, there's a spectrum with regard to that. And we need to get better and better in knowing the plans of God. Psalm 139, 17 says, How precious also are your thoughts for me. Oh God, they're, they're great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand of the sea. I don't know if you ever tried to count the grains of sand in the sea, but it's pretty much impossible. So uh, church, God has got so many good ideas, so many good plans for you. So start counting. You're never going to get there, but start counting. Start taking notes. Start journaling. Start listening. Start praying. Start paying attention and record God's wonderful purposes, the unfolding future that God has for you. Speak to your soul every day and say, Spirit, say, Soul, understand, know, come to terms with just how wonderful, how marvelous the works of God are in you, in me, in us. Do you know about the work of God in you? Are you aware of it? Uh, can you call to mind something that God's asked you to do? You know, this week it could be to pray for someone. There, there could, there's a myriad of things God could be asking of you this week. Fall in love with God's preferred future for your life this week. If you can, it'll change the world, I promise you. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says, are many other plans in the mind of man, many other plans in the mind of man, but the purpose of the Lord will stand. And only the purposes of God will stand the test of time. Your ideas, your purposes will not stand 
they will not stand the, 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 the testimony or the, or the test of time and circumstances, but the plans of God will make an incredible difference. I went up there to Bundaberg and, you know, I didn't kind of know what I was doing. I don't know the church very well. You know, you don't even think about it till about two weeks before you go in and all of them said, this is in the timing of God. And I'm thinking, good. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But God has always got a plan. God is always trying to do business with humanity. 1 Corinthians says, uh, don't you know that you yourselves... How many love this scripture that, don't you know that you are, you yourselves are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and together we are that temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you know the context of that scripture? That's our favorite scripture. Isn't that our favorite scripture? Don't you know that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit? God Dwells in. Do you know the context of that scripture? The direct a verse above it talks about th that everyone's work will be tested. That is the direct context of that quote. That you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. To see, they will be tested to see whether it is gold, silver, precious stone, or hay, wood, and stubble that will be burned up in the final test. And so God is asking us, do you not know that the temp you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God lives within you, the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, that the Holy Spirit resides in you to affect and to, and to empower you to do the works of God. Not to make you feel good. I pray that it feels good. But it's not to make you feel good, feel like, hey, I'm connected to God. It's so that you will have the power. The Holy Spirit is resident. He's partnering with you to do the works of the Lord. You know, and uh, God is it's a great prayer. God, show me your will. Show me your will. I, 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 I encourage everyone. I challenge everyone in this room to pray tomorrow, to pray today. Lord, show me your will. As you're driving home in the car, Pastor Ashley asked me to pray this prayer. Show me your will, but get ready to begin to receive and begin to understand and begin to know that you would come up to speed with God's preferred future for you. And it could happen on the way to work. Turn left. Now, you've got to get good at it before you go doing that, or you might be just wandering around the suburbs. But if you can actually begin to perfect this, th th then God can begin to use you as an instrument in his hands. God, reveal your will, reveal your purposes, reveal your pathways to my heart today. Here's a prayer that, that Jesus told the, the disciples to pray. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. I think really all they wanted was his power. I think all they wanted was the miracles. Make us as powerful as you. Show us how you pray. And he says, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. Can you see this pattern in the word of God? The word of God is not my will. Pray king, the kingdom of God come on earth. I am a kingdom person. You, we are kingdom people. We are called according to the purposes and the plans of God. And I pray that there would be a spiritual awareness that God's purpose would be a key in your life. The disciples say, teach us to pray. These are the words in red. Jesus speaking here. You should start every day with this prayer Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a fantastic, wonderful prayer. I don't think we pray that enough. We just get into our day. Our prayer is a cup of coffee. Help me to get through the day. But what if we just paused on every day, either in the car, just find a moment to say, God, I pray that I wouldn't do my will today. Lord, I know I've got to go to work. I know I've got, to, I've got to provide for my family. Biblically, I understand that. But God, is there a moment? Is there a possibility, Lord God, that, that I can be, uh, that I can be working, walking through a shopping center, that I can be you know, just uh, in the lunchroom? Uh, uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden, there's this godly moment where God's will can be done in someone else's life. The temptation will be to do my will 
in my way. But the best part of my day should be the messed up part of my day. Amen? Where God just starts altering stuff. You ready for that? No, I'm not. I'm not ready for that. It's difficult. I like routine. I don't like being away. In hotels, the hotel I was in, they had a cupboard there and it looked like something was going to jump out of the cupboard at me in the middle of the night. It's not comfortable. Driving seven hours. That doesn't include that we were on the Gold Coast and then back to, to the Sunshine Coast, then up to Bundaberg and then back to, then back to the Gold Coast, and then back to the Sunshine Coast. I don't like it. I don't like it. But sometimes God does like it. He wants to mess up your day. He wants to rearrange your thoughts and your, your spirit in some way that you can be on the front foot of the, the, of the leading and the purposes of God in your life where the Spirit of God begins to lead you, where the Spirit of God begins to speak deeply into your heart regarding the guidance of the Holy Spirit and does a huge number on you and messes up your day entirely. Can't believe he's preaching this stuff. Hey, time's running out. Yeah? Time to get serious. Time to say, hey God, I'm a vessel. Look, God, use me to, to, to make a difference. Lately, I've been reading the story of Philip and I've been, I can't get away from it. I keep going back to it, the story of Philip, where he, while returning from Jerusalem to Gaza, he's directed by the Holy Spirit to take another route home. And on that road, and, and it's the desert road home. I'm sure he's on the coastal pathway. There's coffee shops there, places he can stop and look over the Mediterranean Sea. Sorry about my geography, I don't know. The way of the sea. But the Holy Spirit says, I don't want you to go to your favorite coffee shop. I want you to take the desert road home. And there he meets a man on that road the Ethiopian official for Candrate, who is queen of all of Ethiopia. And that man desperately needs God. He's a powerful man in a powerful position over the nation of Ethiopia. And he's riding home through the desert on his way home to Ethiopia. And God says to Philip, turn down the desert road. Don't worry about your favorite coffee shop. There you'll meet a man. He, he meets this man. Uh, you know the story. He gets saved. Today, Ethiopia is one of the largest Christian communities in the world. Why? Because Philip listened to the Holy Spirit. Because Philip allowed God to mess up his day. What about the good Samaritan on his way to work? He's got the donkey loaded up. He's got all his goods and chattels. He's got his stuff together. And he's on his way to do whatever he does. Trading, I don't know what he did. But he's on his way to work and the Holy Spirit brings him across a man who's in desperate need of help. Unhooks all his goods and chattels. You know, brings out some stuff to attend to the man. Puts him on his donkey. Had to rearrange all his stuff. Takes him to an inn. Gives the inn money. I worked out that that was about, he gave him about $3,000 in today's money to pay for the inn. And, to, to, and he said, when I come back, if you spend any more than that, I'll give you the rest of it. Here's a man on... Now, here's the, the worship leader and the pastor on the other side of the road. In the wrong position in the wrong place, but a Samaritan is in the wrong person in the right place. Man, I don't want to be the right person. Make me the wrong person, God. Mess up my day. You know, shift my, shift my stuff. Move some stuff around in my heart so that I can be on the front foot of all that you want to do. God, I'm, oh, here's a good prayer. God, I'm open today to your better judgment and to the leading of the Holy Spirit to be superimposed over my will. Holy Spirit, I give you permission today. Write this stuff down. God, I give you permission today that it will be your will 
not mine, that is being fulfilled. This is talking about, I'm talking today about doing God's will, knowing the purposes of God and acting out of God's knowledge of your future today. Well, I know that God's got something good lined up for me in the future. No, 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 no. It begins today. Ouch. It begins today. See, everyone's work, what you do for God one day will be judged. It's going to be a final exam on all of this stuff. And I think we live way too in the grace mentality. It's all good. Jesus, you love me. Yes, he loves you. And yes, he saved your soul. And yes, you have a ticket to your heaven. Your mansion is secured. There's a nice link, big bow on it in heaven. But until you're dead, you ain't getting it. And God is watching your race here on earth, and he's got some plans for you. He's got some purposes for you. You're meant to make some damage to the devil's kingdom. You're meant to build the kingdom of God while you're here on earth. And the Bible tells us that God's watching whether your work is gold, silver, precious stones, or hay, wood, and stubble that'll just be burned up. And I'm not saying that you won't, he's going to crucify you in heaven or judge you in heaven, but you will be judged for what you do here on earth. And that responsibility weighs heavy upon me. God has a wonderful, wonderful future for every one of us. But that future is in the operation of the gifts of God. That future is only secured as we learn to get past our human wants, our human desires, our human uh, idiosyncrasies and we allow the Holy Spirit to make us raise a sharp focus on what he wants to do give us accurate hearing I haven't got very good hearing in the natural but boy I've got good hearing in the Holy Spirit I can hear what God is saying went up there to Bundy, Bundaberg I'm prophesying over everyone I don't do it much here because I know you all too well I'm not there prophesying over them is that right? yeah, yeah and, uh, and it's just powerful to see what God wants to do in someone's life. One guy says, you've got a clear call of God in your life, mate. I was doing a men's conference. Clear call of God in your life, mate. What are you doing about it? And he's weeping. He's bawling because he knows it. From South Africa, moved to New Zealand. I said, you only did that to get into Australia, buddy. Shame on you. <laughs> we, we're up, we're, we're, you know, we know what you're up to. Anyway, I prophesied over him and I went up to him afterwards. He said, I've just got so hurt. I've just been so hurt doing the will of God. And I guess I just stopped trusting. And I said, we'll sort it out. I was compassionate. Marginally. Mate, God's on your case. God, God's called you out. Time, time to chuck the, you know, the hurt out. Time to get rid of all that. The baggage that you carry and start doing the purpose of God. One of the girls in the, the, the worship team, I said, God has been talking to you about the will of God in your life for most of your life. Is that correct? She's going. And I said, and you haven't done it. And she went. I said, now I'm going gingerly. She had a big husband, a long beard, big guy. I said, now I'm going very, stepping very gently with this prophecy because I'm a bit scared of your husband. <laughs> and I said... You're a great server and I can encourage you to keep serving, but, but you are called to lead. And you've known that most of your life. And you've avoided it. She's going, well, time's up. Time's up. It's time for you to get on the front foot of God's will for your life. What about the woman with the issue of blood? She fell in love with God's preferred version of her future. Her, her, her version of the future was, I'm going to bleed out. She had an issue of blood. She'd been bleeding for, for many, many years and, and it was not a good situation, especially living in that society because women were seen as, you know, second-class citizen and, and women that were, you know, during the menstrual, menstrual cycle were, were seen as unclean and if they touched a man or they touched anyone else, they were also unclean. But here's this woman who's living in such pain. She says, today, I'm sick of this. 
I'm sick of my version of the future today. I'm going to step into God's future. And she begins to push through the cloud. Now, how many realize that she could have been expelled from the city? She could have been thrown out into the desert because she has disobeyed the laws, God's laws of the land. What about Peter getting out of a boat? Perfectly good boat. Desperate to to walk on water, desperate to touch the supernatural, desperate to get past, you know, this version of his future, you know, just following the Savior around, watching him heal people, watching him walk on water. Peter's going, I want some of this. Now, Peter's got a bit of a way to go yet. God's got to deal with some of the obstacles that get in his way. But, but, But here are these people in the Bible who are getting on the front foot. Philip, the Ethiopian man, praise God that he spoke to that Ethiopian man or that Ethiopian man may not have ever found Christ. And it could be a sliding door situation. Church, the world awaits people like you. The Sunshine Coast awaits people like you who'll take God at his word and activate the fullness of the Holy Spirit and who will submit deliberately and ruthlessly to God's will rather than your will. God's looking to activate through you his will tomorrow. Today. Who corrected me then? Who was that? I dare you. (laughs) Stop it. No, you're actually right. I take the correction. Today, someone might be walking through your world today that God wants to touch. Church, look at me. God's version of what the future looks like is preferable to what your version of the future looks like. And so you would be well advised trying to live your life, rebalancing, retuning, recalibrating the the, the balance of your will to the will of the Holy Spirit, that you would learn to begin to activate some responses and begin to step through the cloud, crowd, begin to step out of the boat, begin to, uh, you know, respond, go the desert road rather than spending too much time in the cafe. Gee, that hurt to say that. (laughs) Nothing I'd rather do than spend a long time in a cafe eating and drinking, praising God. (laughs) I love Elisha, one of my favorite people in the Bible, because Elisha goes up to the the river. Don't let me miss this scripture. 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Jonathan and his armor bearer. He says this. They're surrounded by an enemy army. And he says to his armor bearer, he says, come on, let us go to the outpost of the uncircumcised men. That's the enemy. He says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us, whether by many or by few. Perhaps, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Uh, Another version says, uh, it just might be, it just might be, that the Lord will act on our behalf. Or we might die. If we die, if we live, it's in the will of God. It's a beautiful story. They went up and they conquered. What about Elisha who goes up to the river and he hits the, he hits the river Jordan and, uh, and he begins to cry out. He hits the, the river Jordan. He says, you know, where is the God of Elijah? That's the prayer you should be praying. Where is the God of Elijah? You pray that prayer. You are not Elijah, but every word written in this, this, this Bible, every word is the utterance of God to your life and you need to start praying this prayer. Where is the God of Elijah who can open rivers? Moses stands back there at the Red Sea and the Egyptians are about to uh, catch up to them, to capture them again, take them back into slavery. They're at the Red Sea and Moses says, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. (laughs) Okay, we're going to do this again. Stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Anytime now, it's going to happen. 
And God says to him, what are you doing? I'm telling the people that you're about to act on their behalf. And he says, that's not how it works. Moses, what's that in your hand? It's a stick. No, no, it represents your authority. Remember when you threw it down, turned to a stake, you pick it up, it turns back into a stick. That is the authority that I have given you. Now act in it. Point that stick towards the water. Advance, man. Don't wait for me to do it. You act and I'll step in on your behalf. Too many Christians are waiting for God to act. God, come and change my wife. No! All this rain... I'm going, God, please stop the rain. Stop it. God's given us a promise about that building. God's given us a promise about that church, the sanctuary. God's given us a word. As we step out on that word, as we begin to act on the, the word of God that he's given us, God will step in miraculously and he will do wonderful things on our behalf. But sometimes you've got to march first. Sometimes you've got to raise your stick up first. Sometimes if you want your friend say, stop praying for it. Stop it. Start acting. Pick up the phone. Hey man, been thinking about you lately. Can we get together for coffee? You meet them for coffee. You talk about the weather. Has it been shocking? Been raining a lot. Terrible. Hate that. How's your marriage going? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh. Speak, talk, share. Practice. In your bedroom. I spent two weeks working on very good sermons. Very good sermons. I went over them and over them. I was there at one o'clock at night going, <laughs> editing. One o'clock every night. I get there and God says, don't worry about that. I've got something to say. <laughs> well, how's about you tell me two weeks ago what you wanted to say? <laughs> now nah, that'd be too easy. And just for a four sessions, for probably about, you know, uh, three and a half hours, three plus hours. I just began to sp open my mouth and God began to fill it. And, and they came up to me and said, this is the word of the Lord for us. This is timely. This is in the Lord's timing. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good, not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. Why did God use this scripture? Because they weren't doing anything. That's my favorite scripture, but if you know the context, they weren't doing anything. They were waiting for God to show, show up. They were sitting down, around. They, they, they just sitting around waiting for God. In fact, I, I'm not sure the, the context, I'm off the script now. But there's one point in the scriptures where the Israelites hung up their harps on the willow tree, and the willow tree means weeping. They were so sad that God hadn't worked on their behalf that they took their praise instruments and they hung it on a tree that represents sorrow. What are you doing? Come on, church. Doesn't matter what you're going through. What I know is that God is faithful and he is true. Don't wait for God to act. You act now. Evangelize. Pray for someone now. I want to hear the testimony. Encourage someone. Prophesy over someone. Build someone up. Speak out. Lock in to God's house and serve in his house. Give generously. Don't wait for God to act. Act now and God will act on your behalf. Love people unconditionally and watch the love come back. God, I don't feel love. So go love someone and watch the love come back. David said, I will, give, I will not give anything that has cost me nothing. So David's premise of his life was, I'm going to be a giver. I'm always going to be a giver. No matter what happens, if, if someone gives me something, I'm going to give it away. Because I'm a giver. I will not give something that's cost 
mean nothing. As God began to bless David, it, is, it has been worked out by uh, uh, econ- economists that he donated $200 billion to the building of just God's house. $200 billion. It is estimated that David owned $125 trillion. David was the richest man. It's, it's argued that David was the richest man that has ever lived. Why? Because he understood this principle of activation. He understood it in regard to finance and he would activate his money. He would activate. It was nothing for him to give God. Remember where he started in a cave. Remember when the king was there, he could have taken it. He could have taken the kingdom right there and then. It would have been his. He would have been king. But he says, I ain't going to take something that's not mine. He understood the power of giving. And so he gave King Saul his life back. When he's in that and Saul is asleep, all his problems could could have been over. But he says, I'm not a taker, I'm a giver. And look at the power of his wealth that came as a result of it. Ephesians 5 verse 17 says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Get to know the will of the Lord. Get to understand these principles. That if you will begin to activate, God will begin to move in. Fall in love with God's version of the future. What a beautiful statement, Pastor Ricky. Can't even remember it. Must have been the Holy Ghost. Must have been the Holy Ghost. Ricky said that at a wedding. Such a beautiful wedding, by the way. Filled with thanksgiving and celebration. And uh, I just got to say that Jai's speech, I'm, I've, been thinking, I've been thinking about Jai's speech because it was so wonderful, so beautiful. I reckon he took it off a rom-com somewhere. <laughs> I reckon he's flogged it from a rom-com. Because <laughs> the whole room's going, oh, 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 that's even better. Oh. Everyone wanted to be married to him that. <laughs> I reckon he stole it from a rom-com. <laughs> it was such a beautiful moment. But what about when it's not such a beautiful moment? What about when life sucks? What about when stuff's going wrong? What what about when the doctor comes to you and gives you a diagnosis you did not want to hear? You know, Kate Middleton right now, who who stands before a sick world... I get off course. (laughs) Who shares with such beauty and such grace her story and what she's going through right now, battling cancer. What about when... It's not appropriate for you. You're in a hurry. And the Holy Spirit says to you, come on, I want you to to share with that person at the bus stop. What about then? Well, I'm busy. God, I've got some stuff to do. Now, I don't want to get anyone sacked. I honestly don't. But can we start to... Can we begin to listen to the leadings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit and begin to walk down the road that is least traveled? Can we start to, what about this? Maybe you're not, you don't even move in those areas. Word of knowledge, what's that? But, but what about we start taking on projects where we start praying for people who we know desperately need something in their lives? We know, we could name three or four people right now who desperately, with that cross out the back there, we, put, we pinned people's names to that cross. The job doesn't stop there. Who's going to take that cross and pull those name tags off and write them down in your to-do list for today and say, Lord, I'm going to begin to pray for these people, even if you're too scared to talk to them. Lord, I'm going to begin to pray for these people. We're building a church up there that's bigger than this group. 
Why? Because God has called us to save people, to reach people, to change people's lives, to take them out of depravity, to see God heal people, to touch people's lives. There's not a church that's been built that's big enough to house what God wants to do in this city. Because of financial restrictions, we're building this size church. But we better prepare our hearts right now because God wants to do something. 1 Peter 2 verse 15 says, For the will of God, that by doing good, the will of God is that by doing good, you should, put, you should silence the ignorance of foolish people. How many know that the world, the news cycle, is foolishness? Right now, how many people know that? Honestly, put up your hand if you know that. The news cycle, it's foolishness. The Bible says if you do the will of God, you will silence the ignorance of foolish people. Let me just tell you a story about that. Mike Goog, who I'm not going to go into his pain and his uh, his, his past life and and, and how badly Michael Goog failed God. But all I can say, every news media in Australia would like to write a story on Michael Goog. And just as he was starting his ministry in Port Adelaide, where he is now feeding six to 7,000 people a week. Think about that. He is feeding six to 7,000 people every week. When he started up, he, he, he appeared out of the darkness. He popped up into the news cycle. And a journalist in Adelaide, knowing his story, announced to him, I'm going to do a story on you. So you know, I'm coming to do a story on you. Michael rang us up because we were having him that weekend and the story was going to break that weekend when he was in our church. And he said, look, if you want to cancel, uh, I'd understand completely. He said, across the nation, a a, a negative story could hit the papers and I'll be in your church. I just want to warn you. I said, nah, mate, don't worry about that. Come on up. Michael said to him, before you write the story, will you just do one thing? Will you just do one thing? And he said, she said, sure. He said, will you just come and see what we're doing? And she said, I suppose so. So Michael and his lovely wife walked that journalist through their factory, saw all the volunteers, which some of, bit, some of which were homeless people that were now serving other people. The journalist, so moved by the will of God, was silenced. And she wrote a beautiful, beautiful article about Michael Goog and the work that they're doing in Port Adelaide. The will of God will silence the news cycle. The purposes of God will silence the questions. We are not, church, listen to me, look at me. We are not moving into a time where the church will be uh, persecuted, though the church will be persecuted. We are moving into a time where if God's people can start to care more about God's will than their will, if they can begin to walk down desert roads and take mantles and slap rivers and say, you know, where is the God of Elijah? If they can learn to point their stick and say, come on people, let's move forward into the purposes and plan of God. The church will be an advancing army that will be unstoppable. When the devil comes in, comma, like a flood, I will raise up a standard against him. In this day and age where we see the news cycle getting crazy, calling what is good evil and what is evil good. We just don't worry about that. If we just commit our hearts to say, Lord, I am overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed by the opportunities that you are giving me, Lord God, and I'm willing, Lord Jesus, to be obedient and sensitive to your promptings in my life. We will see this church grow and grow and grow. We will see this city literally start to begin to be penetrated by the power of God. 
The church I preached in in Bundaberg, it's, it's almost this size in a tiny population. And that's not surprising. That's, that's what the norm is supposed to be. God's church is advancing. We are called by God, building a church up at the sanctuary. And you saw a little bit of a, a glimpse of it. Why don't you stand up with me as we bring this to a close? While I was writing this sermon, I just wrote this bordered by the Bruce Highway. What God has asked us to do, it sits on the Bruce Highway. It's bordered by the Bruce Highway. And the Bruce Highway runs from the, it runs the length and the height. It runs the whole from, from Cairns through to Melbourne. You can follow that track, that one highway all the way through. And suddenly, as I was writing this sermon, I saw a picture of our church sitting on the Bruce Highway, going from the top of the country to the bottom of the country. And I just heard the Holy Spirit say to me, this is much bigger, Ashley, than you realise. I've put you there for a reason. And from the length and breadth of this country, you will be a blessing. The river will flow and everywhere the water touches, everything that the water, tu water touches will come to life. That's you. You are that water. There is a river out of our belly, the Bible says, will flow rivers of living water. You are that water. You are that river of God that flows from heaven out of you. And as you begin to be sensitive and begin to be obedient to the plan and purposes of God, we're going to see so many lives touched, so many people changed. I'm going to finish this message with Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23. And I don't know why, uh, but all the way through this message, I said, why, why did I write that that that?" That, that scripture down there it says his compassions never fail they're new every morning great is his faithfulness so tomorrow morning tomorrow morning the mercies of God are with you they are new every single morning and there are people in this church today and you're stuck I don't put your hand up but I know that there are a lot of people here today and you feel stuck. You feel like life has left you behind. That ain't true. It's a lie of the enemy. Great is His faithfulness. The mercies of God will wake you up tomorrow morning. So if that's you today, if you feel like, God, I just feel like I'm stuck. My message to you is this is the prayer. God, not my will, but yours be done. 